Greetings from the Nerd Cave somewhere deep in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Stan Gibalisco here with another little Murphy's Nemesis tale for you. As you may know if you've watched these other videos about Murphy's Nemesis, Ham Radio is Murphy's Nemesis. Well, back in the day when I was a kid living at my parents' house in Rochester, Minnesota in high school, I thought up a bunch of really weird projects, and you've probably already seen a few of them if you're a Murphy's Nemesis fan, and I hope you are. Go to that playlist on my YouTube channel, Murphy's Nemesis. Anyway, I wanted to get some more selectivity out of my receiver for CW. And uh, one way I did that was the notch inverter, which was the best way, really. But I, prior to that, I thought of something else. Audio frequency resonant cavities. I think that pretty well describes what they are. Now I'm going to show you a little more schematically what they are or what they were. They worked pretty well. They worked pretty well. Then again... I think maybe Murphy had at least a partial victory on that one. But so did I. Okay, so here's the theory, the schematic rendition of the audio frequency resonant cavity that I built way back around 1970, 1971 when I was in high school in Rochester, Minnesota. I called them not surprisingly, AFRCs, Audio Frequency Resonant Cavity. Well, surely you have heard of cavity resonators for RF. They're uh, quite commonly used at VHF and UHF, where the wavelengths of radio frequency signals are pretty short on the order of, say, a meter or less. Radio frequency cavities, they look kind of like little barrels with little tuning devices in them. Well, I thought sound waves have a pretty short wavelength in air at the Earth's surface. In fact, the wavelength of a sound wave, we'll call it lambda, is approximately equal to 1100 divided by the frequency in Hertz. That will give you the wavelength in feet. So if I wanted to copy, for example, an 1100 Hertz signal, the wavelength of that CW signal at 1100 Hertz would be about one foot. If it were 550 hertz, half of 1100, the wavelength would be about two feet. Well, I got it into my head, why not experiment with quarter wavelength and half wavelength resonant cavities for sound waves. Now, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't recall whether I used a half wavelength or a quarter wavelength resonant cavity, but I believe it was probably on the order of a half wavelength. What I did is I took a piece of... Actually, I believe it was aluminum tubing. Roughly three quarters of an inch in diameter. So... The diameter of this thing was about three quarters of an inch. That was just about the perfect diameter to fit. Remember those little earphones that came with tape recorders, <laughs> cassette tape recorders, and some of the old transistor radios back in the 1960s? Little earphones, they were about three quarters of an inch in diameter, and they had those little goofy little things that you stick in your ear. They look kind of like a little ear plug. I put one of those at either end of this 
length of tubing and cut it to a foot or two thereabouts. I didn't really care. I was just experimenting. I wasn't going to actually try and use this until I got results that satisfied me. So I, in, into the input here, I put the receiver audio. Came right out of the headphone jack of my Drake R4A receiver, that venerable old thing. Then over here, what I did was I ran this thing to an audio frequency amplifier module that I had purchased at the venerable Radio Shack store. Back in the day, they made these little modules. They were, they were maybe about the size of your fist. I think they were probably a little smaller than that. But you hook them up to a 6 or a 9 volt direct current battery and you get an audio frequency amplifier. And from there I ran it to another headset. So what I was doing in effect was expecting that I would get reinforcement of the sound waves at certain frequencies, very much like the way a musical instrument works. In fact, exactly the way that a musical instrument works. And in fact, the musical instrument that most comes to my mind is the trombone. Now I got the idea that I could create two sliding pieces of tubing. One would just slide over the other and I could then adjust the frequency. And uh, I didn't actually get around to that, but I don't see why it wouldn't work. The idea was that when you got certain resonances, like say a half a wavelength resonance, or a full wavelength resonance, I'm not doing a very good job of that, am I? A full wave, a half wave, wave and a half, two full waves, you'd get an accentuation of the volume from this thing. And I found that in fact that was exactly what did happen. There was a drawback though, a couple of drawbacks. One was that the thing did respond to harmonics. So if I tuned this thing to 550 Hertz, I was also going to get an accentuation of the sound at 1100 Hertz and then again at 1650 Hertz and then again at 2200 Hertz and in fact that is what happened so I had to set this thing for a higher frequency that I'm normally comfortable with but it did accentuate the CW at the frequency of choice and so I was in a sense able to copy the thing fairly well but there was another drawback, another phenomenon. This thing was really a very, very highly selective device. Very, very sharp peak. Not particularly good ultimate attenuation, but a very sharp peak. So the other problem that I got there was ringing. So that CW at higher speeds, 30 and 40 words a minute, was very difficult to copy because of that ringing effect. Perhaps if I would used plastic instead of metal tubing, I would have gotten less of that. But it did work, and the theory was there. It was just a matter of deciding whether or not I wanted to engineer it any further. And I think there's still perhaps some promise to technology like this today. So that's it. That's the news. Murphy did get into that a little bit, but I didn't let her all the way in. Stan Gibalisco, W1GV, signing off until next time, 73, and so long.